Well, I want thank you, Professor Olson. I want to begin just by telling all of you how happy I am to be at Gordon College. This is a great place. And I have a lot of respect for Gordon, and you guys are extremely fortunate to be here. I, I hope you know that. I don't have to tell you this morning that we live in an incredibly polarized and hate-filled culture, but the greatest tragedy of all is the fact that so many Christians, people who are called to be agents of forgiveness and reconciliation, all too often stand at the very heart of that polarization. So I want to ask this morning, how can we as Christians become agents of reconciliation, bridge builders instead of wall builders, and really become the kinds of people Jesus calls us to be? And to answer that question, I want to offer to you three suggestions this morning, each built on a great biblical truth. So here we go, suggestion number one. First, because we often imagine that God can only work through people like us, I want to remind you that God is God and God can work through anyone He pleases. Let me tell you a little story. Some years ago, my wife, Jan, and our son, Andy, moved from Abilene, Texas, where I had taught at Abilene Christian, to California, where I would teach at Pepperdine University. The timing for that move was right in every way but one. And the one way in which it wasn't right was this. Andy was leaving his friends in Texas to begin his senior year in high school. That was a bad thing for us to do to our son. On the day the movers were scheduled to move our belongings into the house, Andy asked, you know, he said, there's nothing for me to do here at the house. The movers could be here all day long, which was true. And he said, would you mind if I just drove down to Santa Monica and spent the day in the Santa Monica Mall? We told Andy that would be fine, but be sure to be back no later than 5 o'clock p.m. We wanted to, it was Wednesday, wanted to go to church that night. Well, 5 o'clock came, no Andy. 6 o'clock came. No Andy. 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. No Andy. Frantic, I drove to the Santa Monica Mall and looked in every nook and cranny of that parking garage for his little yellow Toyota Starlet. But Andy was nowhere to be found. On the 45-minute drive back from Santa Monica to our house, I scoured the freeway for signs of that little yellow starlet to no avail. So finally, at 11 p.m., we called the California Highway Patrol. Thirty minutes later, we heard a knock at the door. The patrolman asked, is your son on drugs? We told him we were certain he was not. Then I'll tell you what he's done, the cop said. He's run away from home. You just give him a week or ten days, he'll call. And with that, he said goodbye and stepped into the night. You can only imagine the depths of our despair. Perhaps the patrolman was right, or maybe not. Who could know? Had he been in a wreck? Had he been kidnapped? Had he been murdered? We didn't know. We wouldn't know the answers to those questions for several more days. Then, on a Sunday afternoon, the phone rang. I picked up the phone and I said, hello. And the voice on the other end said, Dad, this is Andy. Where are you, Andy? I am, now you gotta remember, we're in California, right? Los Angeles area. Andy says, I'm in a Burger King in the Bronx. And here's the story we learned once Andy was home. Andy hadn't driven to Santa Monica Place Mall at all. He had driven all day and all night probably 85, 90, 95 miles an hour, pushing that little Toyota Starlet for all it was worth, across the desert to the small West Texas town of Sweetwater. And there he rendezvoused with his girlfriend from Abilene, Amy. Now what you've got to know is this. Sweetwater is 40 miles west of Abilene. Amy had stolen a credit card from her parents, and with that card had taken a cab from Abilene, 40 miles west, to Sweetwater. And then in Sweetwater, Andy ditched his Toyota Starlet, and they tell the cabbie to take them to Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, 
that's another 180 miles east, and then the cabbie's got to go back to Abilene. Who knows what that cab bill was? They paid the cabbie with Amy's parents' credit card. Once at DFW, they bought airplane tickets to New York City. And once in New York, they checked in to the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. <laughs> the next morning, they had breakfast in bed. They're living the high life indeed. But then, Amy's parents discovered the missing card and deactivated it. Now, Andy and Amy went from the good life to the lives of paupers, street urchins, begging for their next meal. One night, Andy and Amy were trying to get a room at what Andy described to me as a sleazy, run-down dump of a place. And when the man at the counter ran their card through the machine, he said, this card's no good, you can't stay here. But two Indian, as in India, okay, two Indian cabbies were standing there that day overheard this conversation. And they said to Andy and Amy, would you like to come home with us? When I first heard this story, I feared the absolute worst. You can only imagine, you know, my fears. But the worst was not to be. Because that night, the two cabbies from India gave Andy and Amy their beds. They slept on the floor. The next morning, they prepared a marvelous breakfast for Andy and Amy with eggs and sausage, bacon, fruit, biscuits, gravy, juice, coffee. And then they gave these two kids $25 each and told them, we're doing this for you because when we first came to this country, someone else did it for us. And they sent them on their way. In the meantime, my wife Jan had been praying fervently that God would literally send angels to pick Andy and Amy up and bring them home. As I stand before you today, I believe that Jan's prayer was answered, but hardly in the way she expected. It's possible these two cabbies were Christians. Probably not, given the fact they were from India. Much more likely they were Hindus or perhaps Muslims. But regardless, God sent angels to save our children. And an hour after they left the cabbie's house, Andy and Amy called home. So let me repeat. Because we often imagine that God can only work through people like us, I want to remind you, God is God. God can work through anyone he jolly well pleases. And grasping that truth is the first step toward becoming people who are bridge builders, not wall builders, and agents of God's reconciliation. Now, here is my second suggestion. To remember, this is very simple, just remember we might be wrong. And I want to build my suggestion on the great biblical truth that while God alone is God, He alone is God, we are culture-bound, we're time-bound people shackled to the perspectives of a given time and place. For that reason, we're limited in our knowledge, we're limited in our perspectives, we're limited in our understandings, and we might well be wrong about many of the things about which we feel most certain. You know, Scripture speaks of this nowhere more clearly than in the book of Job. You remember this, according to that text, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said to Job, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, Job, and I'm going to question you. You declare to me, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know, a little sarcasm on the part of God. And after a long line of questions of this sort, Job finally answers the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Therefore, I uttered things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, and therefore I despise myself and repent. Well, we can know the truth of Job's confession 
if we will just be honest with ourselves. Look, someone who's lived in Boston, for example, for his or her entire life is hardly equipped to really understand someone from Thailand, for example. And someone like me, who was raised in a small town in West Texas, was hardly equipped to understand someone from Boston, much less from Thailand or Timbuktu, because we all wear cultural blinders, and those blinders mean we're not nearly as smart as we think we are. Look, here's another story. When I was a kid growing up in West Texas, you know, you're going to laugh when I tell you this, but this is really true. I really imagined that Texas was somehow the center of the world. It never occurred to me it could be otherwise. Well, a lot of people in Texas really believe that, so I had a lot of encouragement to think that. But in fact, looking back on it now, I think I sometimes believed that Texas was the world, or at least the only world that really mattered. But I experienced a very rude awakening when I was a senior in high school. A college in Arkansas had invited me to apply, and I was eager to visit. In the meantime, my mother, an elementary school teacher, planned to attend a convention in St. Louis. The route from our house in, in West Texas to St. Louis went right through that little town in Arkansas where this little college was. So all three of us made the trip, my mom, my dad, and me. I was 17 or probably 18 years old. In St. Louis, we stayed in a downtown hotel. And on our very first morning there, my dad awakened me early and said, Richard, would you like to get up and take a walk around downtown with me? Of course, the chance to have to take a walk with your dad, that's great. So I said, of course. But I wasn't prepared for the, what that walk would mean. For once we hit those city streets in downtown St. Louis, I saw something. You'll think this is utterly ridiculous, and it is, and yet it's true. I saw something I somehow never really expected to see. People and lots of them, and they were everywhere, rushing here, rushing there, heading off to breakfast, heading off to work. Intellectually, I suppose I knew that there were people outside of Texas, but emotionally, I really had never really grasped that fact. But if as a Texan my world was small, it was smaller still by virtue of our church. I was reared in a Christian tradition known as the Church of Christ. I still belong to that church but I wouldn't be there today had the not, not the Church of Christ changed dramatically. Because in those days, we really believed we were the one true church. And no one was getting into the pearly gates but us. When I was a sophomore in high school, there was a preacher in our church who had put together a series of film strips that one could use to convert others to the Church of Christ. And I was really eager to share this material with my high school buddies. So one day, they came to my house where I was prepared with the aid of those film strips to teach them what I regarded as the gospel truth. When the film strips were over, my friends didn't convert. They laughed, and they laughed at me. They could hardly believe I could be so narrow. But after my friends were gone, my mother taught me one of the greatest lessons of my life. Son, she said, if you want to convert your friends to our church, that's entirely up to you. But if you discover that they are right and you are wrong, then you are the one who must be willing to make the change. And with these words, she gave me perhaps the greatest gift a mother can give a child, short of life itself and a mother's love. For on that day, she helped me grasp the point that great biblical truth that I might very well be wrong. And why is that such a great biblical truth? Because unless I am prepared to confess my sin, my shortcomings, my failures, my misunderstandings, all the, you know, the ways in which I could be wrong, I'll never hear the gospel of Christ. For the premise of the gospel is that God, that almighty omnipotent, omniscient, infinite God saves us not in our strength, but in our weakness. Not in our success, but in our failure. Not in our knowledge, but in our ignorance. Not in the veracity of our judgments, but in the depth of our miscalculation. 
for God alone is God. And we are just finite mortals who often get it wrong. If we can embrace that truth, we can take another giant step toward becoming bridge builders, not wall builders, and genuine agents of reconciliation. Now, we got the Christian gospel on the table, and I want to build my third suggestion squarely on that same gospel message. Because two affirmations, now listen closely, two affirmations stand at the heart of the gospel message. The first is this, that even though we are undeserving, God extended His grace to us. We get that, right? We all get that. God extends His grace to us. The second is this, that because God first loved us, even when we were undeserving, we must reflect that very same love and grace to others, even though they are undeserving, just like us. Now listen, Jesus Himself made this very point in the synagogue, in His hometown of Nazareth, when He announced His own calling for all to hear. You know the text. When He came to Nazareth, where He'd been brought up, He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was His custom, and He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to bring good news to who? Good news to the, to the poor. He sent me to reclaim release to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the text says that the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Look, what these words mean is this. If we are followers of Jesus, we love sinners. For in the final analysis, they are no different from us. And we must love prisoners and immigrants and Muslims and the poor and all those whom our society loves to cast aside. For this is the biblical vision of the kingdom of God. And we must love those with whom we disagree because they too are created in the image of God. Let me tell you one more story. In 1976, long before we moved to California, we moved to Springfield, Missouri, where I took a, took a teaching position at, at, one, at that time was Southwest Missouri State. It's now Missouri State University. And without a doubt, the single greatest blessing we experienced during all those years was an old Dutchman by the name of Garrett J. Tenzaitoff. Garrett was my department chair and by any measure the most extraordinary person I have ever known. When Garrett was only 15 or 16 years old, younger than you guys sitting in this room today, the Nazis invaded his native Holland. Virtually everyone who served the Tenzaitoff family, their doctor, the local butcher, the teachers in the village school, virtually everyone who served that family in various ways, they were all Jews. And the Tinsaita family, along with many other Christians in that neighborhood, watched as those faithful servants, one by one, disappeared off the face of the earth. And so the Christians in that neighborhood began to shelter their Jewish friends and neighbors. Then, that in itself was a stunning act, for many Europeans, including many Christians, despise the Jews, just as many Americans today, including many Christians, despise immigrants and Muslims. I first met Garrett when Garrett was in his 60s, and he told me that his worst memory of that entire ordeal, sheltering Jews, was teaching Jewish children the Lord's Prayer. And why? Why would that be his worst memory? Because he said, when the Nazis found Jewish children, they always asked them to pray. 
And when the children began with the words, Baruch, Bata, Adonai, the Nazis took them out and killed them. And why was that Garrett's worst memory from that entire ordeal? Because he said, we had to make something of them that they were not. Now, the fact that this is Garrett's worst memory tells us much about the depth of this man's compassion. Not just for people like himself, but for all human beings. For what I'm about to tell you next would be, for most of us, the very worst memory of all. Shortly after the Nazis invaded Holland, they captured Garrett. I mean, just imagine this, 15-year-old kid. They cook, took him to a prison camp in Berlin. They wanted Garrett to tell them who in his neighborhood back in Holland was sheltering Jews. But Garrett refused to tell because he knew the Nazis would use that information to murder even more victims. So when Garrett refused to demolish this information, if you can imagine this, three Nazis, three Nazi soldiers, held Garrett, this 15-year-old, slightly built kid, held him horizontally and rammed him headfirst into a brick wall. What? Now, who's sheltering Jews? Garrett won't tell. What? Now, who's sheltering the Jews? Garrett won't tell. Whomp! Over and over, rammed him headfirst into the brick wall. Garrett never spoke a word. When I first heard this story, I thought immediately of that marvelous summary of the gospel that we find in 1 John, verse 16. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. And here was Garrett, a 15-year-old kid, doing exactly that. One day, the Allied Air Forces scored a direct hit on the prison where Garrett was held captive, and he walked free. But he knew he would be shot on sight if he encountered Nazi soldiers, since he had no papers whatsoever. So he went to a train station, and he picked up Nazi propaganda, swastikas, and photos of Hitler. And when he saw a Nazi soldier, he'd held that propaganda up high and say, Heil Hitler! Of course, he lied. But in that way, he was able to walk home. It was either lie or be killed, you understand. So he was able to walk home to his native Holland. Garrett arrived back in his native village about the time the war was over. And he found in his parents' home three children he'd never seen in his life. He asked his mother, who are these children? And once she explained, Garrett, and I'm going to tell you this story in the exact words Garrett used when he told this story to me. Garrett's now deceased. He died of his injuries, by the way. He asked his mother who they were. Once she explained, Garrett stalked out of the house, slammed the back door behind him, and exclaimed, they're Nazis. I won't stay under the same roof with those bastards. Garrett recalled that his mother followed him out the back door, and she said, Garrett, you're right. Their parents were Nazis, but we are Christians, and we shall stand with the suffering. I think I've never heard a more powerful story about loving those with whom we disagree than this one. And so, let me wrap this up. If we ask how we as Christians living in this age of hate-filled polarization, how we as Christians might become agents of reconciliation, bridge builders instead of wall builders, the answer can be found at the heart of the gospel message. For there in the gospel message, we find three great truths that can transform every one of us into people who will bring love, not hate, to a broken world. Let's recap those truths. The first of the truths is this, God is God. He alone is God. He can work His will through people very different from us. 
Indeed, even through people whose perspective on religion or culture may be radically different from our own. He can work through anyone he jolly well wants to work through. Let him be God. The second great truth is this, that if God is God, guess what? We are not. And that means that we are frail and finite and inevitably limited by cultural constraints and therefore, guess what? We often get it wrong even when we think we are profoundly right. And third, the gospel calls us to love the unlovely and to love the undeserving because, again, guess what? We too are unlovely and undeserving in so many ways. And here's where the story of Garrett Tinsaitov speaks extraordinary truth. For the gospel called the Tinsaitov family to love and care for Jews on the one hand and orphaned children of Nazis on the other. And in like manner, the gospel calls on each one of us today to love prisoners, to love immigrants, to love Muslims, to love the poor, to love everyone whom our society loves to hate or loves to cast aside. But in our particular context, in this hate-filled age of polarization, the gospel calls us to love even those with whom we most profoundly disagree. And we may well disagree, but we're still called to love them. And in this way, we can become agents of reconciliation who build bridges, not walls, but bridges of love and hope instead of walls of hate and despair. May God bless this meditation on his holy word. Thank you so much for your kind attention. It's great to be with you guys.